It's a wonderful opportunity to speak before you in this Common India Conference. I thank Dr. Mayur Agarwal for providing me this opportunity. So what I plan to do in the next 20 minutes or so is to look at endocrinology as a whole, but quickly trying to provide the interest and the challenge in the management of endocrine disorders. Uh, so if we, uh, so the first part of the talk is uh, essentially didactic. The later half is only through photographs that I've taken of various patients and their issues over the last 40 years. So if you think of endocrinology as a discipline, it's relatively new. But if you think of endocrine disorders, I think they are amongst the oldest recognized diseases that one knows. For example, if we talk of diabetes, the earliest references are in the Ebers papyrus in Egypt, uh, which is probably 700 or 800 BC. And then we have in our own country reference to Madhu Meha, which is what diabetes is, uh, way back uh, by Jarab and Shushru. And then if we go down different important points in uh, the landmark events in the development of endocrinology, I don't think we need to go into all the details, but we remember that the science actually had a boost in the 20th century with the discovery of different hormones. First on the list is adrenaline in the year 1901, then secret in 1902. But the word hormone itself was used only in 1905 by Sir Starling, Ernst Starling, during his Kroonian lectures in London. And then we have a list of so many different hormones and the discovery of hormones continued even into the 21st century with new hormones like resistin and visfatin and adiponectin being identified. While this journey continues, this is again uh, uh, remembering Starling, who first used the word hormone in 1905. Okay. Now, if you think of the definition of hormone, the classic definition of hormone as a chemical substance produced in a specialized gland, which is released into the bloodstream and transported to distant tissues to elicit physiological responses. But we already know that this understanding of hormone and actions has undergone a lot of change over time. For example, we now know that hormones need not come only from specialized glands. We, we always talk of the pituitary, the thyroid, the adrenal, the gonads. But hormones are known to be produced practically all across the body. So either they could be some specialized cells dispersed in other tissues. For example, in the intestinal lining, you have endocrine cells which secrete uh, maybe the GLP-1 or GIP that we all know. And then even otherwise normal cells, fat cells, are known to secrete so many hormones like leptin or adiponectin. And then our classic understanding is that hormones have to be produced in one part and have to be carried over long distance to, to, to have an effect in a different part of the body. But now we know that hormones can act locally which we refer to as paracrine, which is just outside the cell from which this hormone arises, or it could even be autocrine, that is the cell that produces the hormone can influence itself. So these are new, new understanding. And we also now understand that hormone receptors can be present much more widely than in classic 
organs or tissues that are known to be uh, final effector organs for different hormones. For example, let's uh, take the example of prolactin. Prolactin, the primary organ for its action is known to be the breast for causing milk secretion, milk production. But now we understand that prolactin receptors are present widely on different cell types, including on lymphocytes. So what are prolactin receptors doing on lymphocytes? So it must be having some immune related action as well, which is not a classic action of prolactin. And this, this slide lists uh, once again, the classic sites of hormones and the non-classic sites and different hormones that are produced and, and these days we talk a lot of about pro BNP as, as, as a marker of heart failure, and we, which is secreted from the heart. So heart, once again, is also an endocrine organ. So which organ is not an endocrine organ? Now we, we are in a difficulty to find out. And uh, as we were saying, the understanding has undergone a lot of change. So we thought one gene could produce one hormone, we thought one cell could produce one hormone only and one hormone acts on only one receptor but we now know that there could be multiple receptors for the same hormone for example estrogen receptor alpha and beta both attract estrogen similarly one hormone has one coherent action now we know that one hormone could have so many different actions and very importantly in the past we thought that hormone concentration if we could measure in blood then that will give us an idea of the hormone action at the tissue level but now we understand from the concept of receptor up regulation down regulation that the same level of hormone may give rise to practically no effect of the hormone because of hormone resistance and that's because of receptor down regulation that's of course one mechanism so these are all the recent advances, the understanding in the discipline of endocrinology. So now we have established that endocrine disorders are there for time immemorial. And there has been a lot of uh, advances in the understanding of endocrinology. And we also wish to put on record that endocrine disorders are quite common in our country. If we put together thyroid disorders and diabetes, which are by far the most common endocrine disorders that we see. But there are a whole host of others. And I think metabolic bone disease is something which is newly being uh, uh, over the last new, new doesn't mean absolutely new, but over the last 15 years or so is being recognized that metabolic bone disease is an endocrine disorder. And so if we add all of these together, then possibly it's more than 170 million people in our country are suffering from one or the other endocrine disorder. Now, now that brings us to the topic, endocrine kaleidoscope. Why is this name? Well, I'm sure as a child, you, just as I have been fascinated by this small toy, the kaleidoscope, where if you turn the kaleidoscope a little bit, it, you, you come to see a whole new set of colors and patterns. So similarly in endocrinology, I think each patient is different from the next one. And we see so many different hues and patterns of the same disease. So let me now try and take you through the excitement of an endocrinologist uh, in, in its clinical and the clinical charm related to endocrinology I'll show you different uh, actual real life cases. Now, this is a lady who is elderly, more than 65, uh, who has got a large toxic multinodular coiter. I do remember because she was mother of one of the nurses in our uh, institute. Now, we had suggested that surgery is the best form of treatment, but she just refused. She said, no, I'll, I'll continue with medical treatment, whatever you have to offer. So we could control her hyperthyroid features with antithyroid drugs, but those large thyroid nodules which clearly cannot dissolve just by giving medicines. But uh, remember that this uh, lady looks otherwise healthy and is fully conscious. 
This is a younger lady who is just about 50, who also has got multinodular goiter, but who looks, who looks clearly sick, is already having difficulty breathing. And she, on top of that, was euthyroid, whether the previous elderly lady was hyperthyroid. So euthyroid should make things simple. But clearly these thyroid nodules are pressing on the trachea and sort of suffocating her. So what determines these symptoms would be which way these thyroid nodules are growing. If they're growing out, outwards, then they are not causing compression of the trachea. However, if they are going inwards, and this seems to be the case in this particular lady, this can lead to catastrophic uh, uh, results. So the same condition, multinodular goiter, could present in different ways. And this is just in passing, I wish to uh, mention that this patient, is, by the appearance of the patient, one could almost make a diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis. And there was a time, unfortunately, several decades back where uh, radiation was used as a form of treatment and was supposed to reduce the pain related to this inflammatory condition and this gentleman was moving around with a huge goiter this is a side view and i think we have a front view and the gauze piece was uh, uh, there because the the lesion was ulcerating and this was a case of likely radiation induced thyroid malignancy and it's very uncommon these days to see such large goiters remember uh, uh, this was a photograph taken i think in the late 80s or early 90s so we have progressed significantly and rarely do we see such huge goiters these days now what when we are on the issue of thyroid so hypothyroidism is one of the more common endocrine conditions that we see and a condition that is very uh, uh, satisfying to treat most of the time now hypothyroidism is associated some of the classic clinical signs is loss of scalp hair loss of eyebrows these are almost classic symptoms or signs in a patient of hypothyroidism now see on the left we have a girl of six years who has got increased hair over her back this is downy sort of hair not terminal hair and on the right the same and, and she was diagnosed to have primary hypothyroidism with quite high tsh value she was treated with thyroxine and the same girl uh, this is a different uh, more close-up view uh, so it's the same girl which was a significant reduction in that excess hair growth over the back. So the point that I'm trying to make is hypothyroidism classically causes hair loss, but it can also cause increased hair growth, especially downy hair growth, and maybe uncovered areas of the body which can improve, which can decrease after successful treatment of hypothyroidism. Now, once again, we know hypothyroidism as a condition that is associated with slowness of metabolism, with, with everything slows down, your mental process slows down, you grow less, and so on and so forth. Your body is delayed. But the girl on the left actually was referred to us from gynecology department. Now, she is a girl of four and a half years. Now, she had breast development, and on this slide, we can demonstrate uh, we can see the breast development breast being right the breast being enlarged which was there for the last six to eight months other of course had uh, ignored it but then when she had the first menstrual bleed was she brought to the hospital and she had been taken to the gynecology department and there they found on ultrasonography large cystic ovaries and they were ready to do surgery for those cysts somehow they they they, they sought an endocrine consultation now looking at this girl we could clearly suspect hypothyroidism it was almost written on her face hypothyroidism and we did the blood test it was indeed cross primary hypothyroidism with tsh fellow more than 100 
And so we somehow requested our gynec colleagues, please do not operate on this girl. Let us give her medical treatment. Let us see how she progresses. And so rather reluctantly, they agreed to it. And this is the same girl after about four months where the breast has no further enlarged, possibly has regressed somewhat. She did not have any further bleeds. So now the point that I wanted to make is, so the same disease, hypothyroid, so while classically, typically causes delayed puberty, it can also cause precocious puberty, particularly in girls. So we should remember about hypothyroidism being a cause of uh, uh, precocious puberty as well. Now, this is another lady. This is a lady of, uh, she is about 55 years. Now she has a puffy face, uh, some pallor, and the general physician had done a thyroid function test and found a TSH being about seven, which is a little bit high, but not high enough. And so he thought that he's got the cause for her symptoms and signs and referred to us. But on clinical examination, and here again is the importance of clinical examination, what we find are these veins on the neck, prominent veins on the neck, which made us suspect there may be something amiss. So we just did a chest x-ray and we found a large shadow there, uh, and as well as mediastinal lymph nodes. So this was a case of malignancy, a lung carcinoma with mediastinal lymphadenopathy causing superior venacaval syndrome which by interfering with the venous drainage from the upper half of the body it causes these veins to be dilated and cause this puffy face so we need to be very careful about our clinical examination uh, just we cannot do by treating the blood reports now we come to hyperthyroidism and Graves' disease is an autoimmune condition where associated with hyperthyroidism and an enlarged thyroid, you have prominence of the eyes, bulging of the eyes, redness of the eyes. So this is a condition that is treatable, typically in the past with intravenous uh, oral steroids, then we had intravenous steroids, now we have other immunosuppressives that can be added like mycophenolate acetate and uh, mycophenolate, mofetil, and so on. And this is the same person after about three months, significant reduction of the eye size, the redness is less, the proptosis is less. So this is Graves hyperthyroidism. Now this was another lady who also had a sub -sub -sub prominent stare on the left eye, and she also has a vitiligo, vit uh, mark of vitiligo on her neck and also possibly on her face around the eyes. So we thought uh, this must be a case of uh, Graves' disease once more. So we sent off the blood for tests. And lo and behold, what came out was hypothyroidism. We thought the laboratory must have goofed up. So we asked them to do the test again. But again, the test was similar. So once again, the point that I wanted to make is while of ophthalmopathy or eye signs are typical of Graves' disease, of hyperthyroidism, we can see somewhat similar, usually less prominent, and much, much less commonly similar eye symptoms and signs even in hypothyroidism because the underlying mechanism is autoimmune. So it can cause also in hypothyroidism. Now we turn to the adrenal glands and primary adrenocortical insufficiency is a condition that uh, is associated with diffuse body pigmentation, skin pigmentation, mucosal pigmentation associated with significant sim systemic symptoms. Patient feels weak, tired, uh, has nausea, loss of appetite, has low blood pressure and so on and so forth. So this is a gentleman who had uh, adrenocortical insufficiency. And uh, this on the left was his initial presentation. On the right, after about a year, when the pigmentation had become much less. However, in this, in, in management of this patient, we made a mistake. Now, primary adrenocortical insufficiency in our country many a time is because of infective etiology, because of tuberculosis of the adrenal glands or histoplasmosis. 
Whereas in the West, it is mostly of autoimmune origin. Now, in this gentleman, we found enlarged adrenal glands. We did an FNSC and we and the, and the report was consistent with tuberculosis. So we started him off on anti-tubercular drugs. And after a month or so, he came back. And of course, this picture that I'm showing on the right is much later, but in between, in about a month's back a time, he came back very ill, collapsed, uh, almost dying to our emergency. So what had we done wrong? We had given him uh, a steroid replacement, hydrocortisone, but we had also given him antitubular yes. drug, of which included also rifampicin, which is a potent hepatic enzyme inducer. So what it does is whatever hydrocortisone we are giving, it metabolizes it rapidly, breaks it down rapidly. So if a patient with hypoadrenocorticism because of adrenocortical tuberculosis needs antitubercular drugs, let us be clear that if we are using rifampicin, we should be doubling or tripling the dose of hydrocortisone so that this patient does not develop uh, this worsening of the adrenal crisis because of Adreno, uh, because of antitubular drug. Now, because of the awareness that uh, primary adrenal insufficiency can cause pigmentation, this girl was referred from skin department. Mm -hmm. I would see, despite the intense pigmentation of her, of her palms, the tongue or the mucosa is not pigmented. So this patient was also, we, uh, we undertook the test, but Hormonally, she was found to be normal. So this is some form of primary pigmentary dermatosis. Now, while on the uh, subject of adrenal, we come to adrenal tumors. Now, this is a gentleman who has got a lump as it's marked out on the abdomen, which was thought to be an enlarged spleen. And he was admitted in gastroenterology department for assessment. And we were referred because he also had gynecomastia, middle-aged man, why he should have gynecomastia. It turned out eventually that this was an adrenal mass, a large adrenal mass, which was because of an adrenocortical carcinoma. And this carcinoma was producing some feminizing hormones giving rise to gynecomastia. So this adrenocortical carcinoma with feminizing features. Now, this is another boy which, who is younger, about 17 years, who also has got adrenocortical carcinoma. Unfortunately, at this point of time, he also had liver metastasis. And he also has got gynecomastia. But on top of that, he is Cushingoid, clearly Cushingoid. So not only does he have feminizing features, he also has features of excess glucocorticoids so it's the same adrenocortical carcinoma remember the previous gentleman did not have any features of cushing syndrome and now we come to a four-year-old girl who has got again an adrenocortical carcinoma but what she has got is excess virilization at age four she has already developed mustache her pubic hair has appeared and she has got significant clitoral enlargement so the point once again that I'm trying to bring home is the same adrenocortical carcinoma under the histopathologist's knife or under the microscope. It's the same adrenocortical carcinoma. But in one, the feature is only feminizing. In the other, it's feminizing plus glucocorticoid excess. And yet in another, it could just present with androgen excess. So the same adrenocortical carcinoma with different features. And this is a, a, a sim. Sip pair, both of whom were grossly short. Now, grossly short, we, we commonly ascribe to growth hormone deficiency. So we did the growth hormone test, which is normal. Then we, we, we thought it's because of growth hormone resistance. So we did the IGF-1 test, which is a measure of growth hormone action at the level of liver. Now, that was also normal to high. So this is one of the very, very rare instances of IGF-1 resistance causing short stature. Now, this is a 16 or 15-year-old girl who was being treated in neuromedicine outdoor because of her epilepsy. Now, she also has, as you can uh, clearly find out, a mature cataract in the right eye. So she was referred to the eye department 
And the eye department thought that it's not quite all right that a 16 year old girl should be having cataract. So somehow they referred to us. And then we evaluated and found that she was grossly hypocalcemic. And this hypocalcemia uh, was because of hypoparathyroidism. And so we remember that hypoparathyroidism can uh, give rise to seizure like manifestations. So this child, this this girl was being treated just as an epilepsy, but what she had underlying was hypocalcemia. And so under our follow up, under our treatment, the calcium levels improved. And over a couple of years, we were gradually able to wean her off the anti epileptic medications. This is a case of precladic cells of the testis. They produce excess testosterone even without getting stimulus from LH, which normally happens at puberty because of a constitutional activation of the G protein coupled receptors on, uh, on these Dedic cells are tested. So this is a rare condition and, and this. But triglycerides were high and she had this typical appearance which suggests lipoatrophy. See? Loss of buckle pad of fat, loss of fat over her forearms or over her arms, which makes her muscles look so much prominent. So this is also a case of insulin resistance. Again, if we measure the insulin, it will be high. It will be much higher than in the previous case. But the blood glucose is also high. So we had high insulin with normal glucose in the previous uh, girl with polycystic ovarian disease. This is high insulin with high glucose because the insulin level is high. But the resistance is so severe that even elevating the level of insulin, the body is not able to compensate for the level of insulin resistance. And then we come to this. Uh, this is uh, not uh, the patient's photograph, but this is CT scan of abdomen. This was a middle-aged man who was behaving abnormally at times. So he had been taken to a psychiatrist. And uh, nothing came of it he was put on antipsychotic he continued to gain weight but he continued to have abnormal spells of behavior and so eventually he was referred to us and when we admitted he did a thorough sort of clinical examination and following up uh, during uh, uh, hospitals his hospital stay we found that he was developing low blood glucose and those low blood glucose levels were coinciding with these periods of abnormal behavior because of the neuroglycopenia. And so we further evaluated, found that he's got high insulin levels. And then we did a CT scan, a triphasic CT scan, and we found that there was a tumor in the, uh, in the pancreas. Uh, it's marked out here, which is an insulinoma. So this is a case where, again, the insulin level is high, but the glucose level is low. So remember, the insulin level could be high with a normal glucose, with a high glucose, or and even a low glucose as, as in this individual. But of course, uh, after removal of the tumor, he was completely cured of his symptoms. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is a short sort of overview of the exciting and enigmatic world of endocrinology. Hope it helps us understand and appreciate uh, endocrine disorders better and also the difficulties that we endocrinologists feel uh, time to time. Uh, thank you very much for your patient here. So, 